Wonderful. Anita, welcome. Thank you for joining me for Gurus on the Spot. Can you tell us a little bit about Andal, who she was, when she lived, what would a day in her life have looked like? First, meet Andal. Okay. In her left hand, she's holding a parrot. Her hairstyle is very much like the women of those days, which is like um, 6th, 7th, 8th century, going on to 16th, 17th century in southern Tamil country, we call it, where women and men uh, wore their hair in top knots uh, off to one side, either up here or lower down. So she is also witness to our conversation today. She's said to have lived somewhere in the 8th century of, the, of uh, the common era. We don't know who her parents were. She was found in uh, as a little foundling in the garden adjacent to the Vishnu temple. She was left there and the priest who was the garland maker found this little baby and took her as his own and raised her. So she was called or named Goda, Goda which means a beautiful garland because she was watching her father making garlands for the Lord and singing songs in praise of the Lord. And um, imagine a household where your foster father is imagining himself to be a woman and, um, and the mother of baby Krishna. So he's singing love songs, a maternal love song to, to baby Krishna. And Goda is listening to all this. And she grows up saturated with, with the landscape of uh, a maternal love and devotion at the same time. Andal is the name that she was given uh, after her lifetime, because the word means the one who ruled the Lord's heart, uh, raised in a very conservative um, Brahmin family, uh, but who probably woke very early and escaped from her home to go to, to where the milkmaids lived, because they would also rise very early to milk the cows. And of course, they came from another community, far more free, and they would be, they would be you know, drenched in the smell of milk and butter, but they would also be talking about, maybe gossiping about the men they had a crush on or the or what happened the, just the previous night or the intimacy of their sex lives, who was pregnant, who was not, who was going to get married. So she finds herself drawn to that kind of, that kind of community. And she imagines being in love with Krishna because he also came from that uh, the cowherd community. So uh, a day in her life, Veena, would be rising very early, going uh, very quickly to where uh, her girlfriends from another world were, maybe even uh, sharing in the chores, then perhaps going home, having a quick bathing, finishing some duties that her mother and father wanted her to do, maybe in the kitchen, and escaping then to the garden next to the temple where she was found as a baby, and writing her poetry and dreaming and singing um, about her love. So her life was very short. She was still a teenager when she's supposed to have sort of disappeared or been absorbed into, uh, into uh, Vishnu Krishna. But um, I also feel, Veena, that there, there could be a larger discussion perhaps later about how we, uh, we disappear these very bold female voices very early. We rarely have given these women the agency to grow old and share their wisdom. And her poetry has become some of the, the most iconic and long lasting poetry that the world has ever seen. And I know, Anita, that you have been fascinated with Andal and have been working with her for a very long time since you were very young. So can you tell us a little bit about what is it that continues to fascinate you about her? What is it as a bhakta that you get from her? So we have to thank, we have to thank many people who came um, in, in the path of uh, mystic poetry and social revolution after Andar's time, because um, her poetry could have disappeared if not for other male poets who came in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and following centuries, who realized that the singular remarkable power of the feminine voice 
and actually in a sense resurrected her and expanded and embellished her temple in her hometown of Sri Viliputur. And subsequent kings and emperors uh, embraced uh, her as their patron uh, goddess. Because mm. in her lifetime, she was not a goddess. And of, of all the mystic poet saints of India, she's the only one to have been elevated to the rank of a goddess with her own temple. Now, Andal is still, she's a living tradition. We are entering uh, the season, our annual season, which begins in the, on the 16th of December. Her songs are sung every day in Vishnu temples in many parts of South India and maybe across the world. There are groups of women still who gather now with Zoom uh, and who chant her, who chant her 30 songs. Uh, they, ri they rise at dawn. These, these songs are supposed to be sung early morning and women still continue the tradition. Music composers have made them memorable, very famous classical music composers. So if you, those 30 songs called the Tiripave, they, they just, they just, em they are embedded in my brain because I grew up learning them, uh, listening to my grandmother, my mother, because I come in the path of the Andal or the Vishnu um, tradition of Bhakti. And she's become synonymous with the best of Tamil poetry. Um, she represents Tamil culture, the, the zenith of Tamil literature. So she represents many things to many people. Somebody calls her, calls her mother, somebody calls her a sister. But for me, Veena, I don't know if um, she was also present uh, when I emerged because they say, when every uh, Sri Vaishnav girl is born in this earth, Andal watches with all the women. You know, she's watching and welcoming her. Oh. But, mm -hmm. but she's she has, um, she's some, someone that first I approached as a, a young dancer, seven, eight-year-old dancer, because her early songs were so sweet and innocent. They suited a youthful dancer, as someone who was seven years old or eight years old, because it just spoke about let the world prosper, let the rains come on time, let the fields, you know, flourish with grain and fruit and let the cows, uh, you know, bear milk. So it were, these were songs of generosity. These were songs that, that anybody could respond to. So Andar's songs lent themselves so beautifully to dance. People could sing them in a group. I'll give you an example when I say, Mane, Mani Vandita, Margari Raduan, Melea Shaiva Nagar, Vendu Vanakirti, Nyana Tayila, Nadunga Mural Vana, Ali Nila, Arule Lorem Babai. So you can actually sing it together and picked up her book of poetry at many different points in my life and have been drawn to the, the fierce, ferocious intelligence that her poetry uh, shows. Because here is a voice that was unafraid. Can you imagine somebody who starts off in a very traditional way, but then uh, challenges uh, Manmada, the god of love, and says, hey, I'm going to challenge you. If you don't aim that arrow towards Krishna and make him look at me, guess what? I'm not going to bathe. I'm not going to brush my teeth and I'm not going to comb my hair. And if I lose my looks, it's going to be all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> you know? This is wonderful, Anita. And I, I think that that phrase, the ferocious intelligence, you really embody that so beautifully in your dance and in your life. So I can see how... In many ways, you embody Andal. You know, I can see that she really travels with you. She stays with you. But I also want to show you, uh, because as she is part of a living ritual tradition in, in her own temple, you know, here she is cross-dressing in, in, as, as Vishnu. In all these photographs, except the very end, she is she's dressed in, you know, she's, she's a man, you know, as Krishna stealing the butter. And so there she is with, you know, uh, as uh, with the whip. So here is a fearless, here's a fearless individual, a spirit that even the people who are decorating her, even the priests, and I've heard them have amazing, loving conversations 
So how are you, my dear, today? How are you feeling this morning? And they're changing her sari and changing. So there is such an intimate relationship that not just me, but so many thousands and millions of people have with her. And, you know, your heart breaks when at the end of her poetry, she only wrote... Um, 114, 173 song poems, which is much less than many, many other saint poets who have written far more. But those 173 are searing, you know, searing uh, in their intensity. She calls, uh, she says, uh, for this great, the great architect of the uh, Bhagavad Gita, the Kurukshetra War, who talks about dharma and um, re-weighing the scales of justice, she says, you're a thief and a liar and you twist words. What do you know about dharma? You yeah. know? This is one of the fantastic things about the bhakti tradition is that, you know, the ninda stuti, for example, is a very well-known form where one mocks and scorns and, you know, throws insults to at the divine. And I think this is a fantastic demonstration of the intelligence within the Indian wisdom traditions where it's understood that, Emotion is a very powerful gateway to, for us to express that relationship with life, with what we call divinity. It's a powerful mode of expressing and expansion of self. She is one of the part of the family. And so you can scold her, you can confide in her, you can seek her blessing. So let's yeah. talk a little bit now about the stage presentation. And working yeah. as an artist, um, because Andal is iconic. So what are the challenges for an artist when one is presenting such an iconic historical figure? You know, I, I, I look at this image and I say, maybe she's fixed for, for this image in this mode. But I feel that dancers only look at this. They also fix themselves. You know, they get fixed by the external. Everybody wants to wear this very pretty side knot and they want to hold a parrot in their left hand and they want to hold, they want to wear this open garland and they want to be this pretty young girl and stay there. They only uh, doing the safe early poems. You know, so people tend to miss that kind of drive, the kind of energy, the kind of excitement, the kind of leadership you know, that, that she demonstrated uh, when she wrote her early song, she may not have even been a teenager by that time. So they tend to miss the spirit and they tend to stay in the, in the pretty mode. What they do is they're actually not giving themselves a chance to explore the girl she was, the, the, her flowering into, uh, into early womanhood, you know, her body changing, which she talks about, she talks about my body's changing, my breasts are filling out. I'm ready now for you, Krishna. They seem to miss those moments. Most dancers take the safe way and they just go with the expected image. And I would urge people not to do that because she, is, she isn't. She has transgressed and she has crossed all these lines of propriety in her words, in her very words searing, searing pain and intensity and longing that all of us actually carry within us as seekers. To seek also means you have to be open to both yes. pleasure and pain. Yes. You, know, you have to be open to both. It can't be just a joy ride. She is showing you the way in yes. her own pleasure and pain. It's she like her words give you permission to go there. Yes. But, but I think that, you know, you mentioned playing safe. And I think this is one of the key problems that a lot of classical Indian dancers face. But, you know, we love the pretty costume, the beautiful costume. It's almost like people can start to hide behind the costume, yes. right? And what you're saying, I think, is that Andal, there is an invitation here to get personal. Yes, because Veena, think about it. If she was brought up in a really simple family, would she be wearing silk and jewelry? I mean, you know, you could just wear a soft washed cotton, you know, tie your, tie your hair really simply or braid it and just emote her poetry. 
you know, she didn't have she didn't have access to what she's now become in the in the temples, you know, with all the opulence. Mm. But how would how would you illuminate her words? And I think that her life is just an open invitation to interpret it without falling back on the iconic goddess that she has become. I've always uh, pushed uh, beyond that, of course, uh, in my various presentations of Andal. Just sit very quietly, even on a high, high stool or just on a floor with a single source of light, as she did when she snuck into the Sanctum Sanctorum which you know only has lamplight. Layers between the goddess and the humanity. And I think as artists, as we mature, it feels like there actually there is a responsibility to get more into the humanity, get more into the reality of her life. Take off the beautiful costumes, put on something much more simple. She lends, lends herself beautifully to lots of translations. Already over the last five years, there's been a, surge in the numbers of telling, retelling across the continents. I call her the CEO of her own company because that's what she is now. She has a whole business that, she, that she's running. Andal continues to live not only in the land of her birth and her life, but right across the globe. And she's a wonderful invitation to us. Thank you so much for making her accessible, both as a historical figure and as a being to be presented on the stage, but also I think most importantly, as a very real living human being who crossed so many lines, broke boundaries and led with such extraordinary passion and courage. Thank you, Veena. It's always a pleasure to talk about her. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I truly believe that she is a shadow. She just walks beside me. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, has always been there whenever I want to turn to her. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity.